Hello and welcome. Some of the world's largest banking and financial services companies are present in India, but in more ways than one. Firms like Barclays not only have a front consumer facing or an institutional presence, but they also have a large global capability or a global captive center and have been here for more than a decade. And that's become large. So what are these people doing and how does that all multiply, the looking at the skills and the embedded knowledge and the capabilities? What is it delivering today and what's the landscape looking like? Well, to discuss that, I'm joined by Praveen Kumar, co-CEO of Barclays Global Service Center in India. Praveen, thank you very much for speaking with us. So first question is really that. I mean, when you, when you look at all these capabilities that you've amassed in the last decade or more than that, uh, what does it mean today uh, in terms of what you are doing and how you're delivering to your end customer, which is someone who's using the Barclays service somewhere in the world? No, absolutely. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, uh, Govind, for this opportunity. Uh, so, uh, Barclays has been in India for a number of years and we have a significant scale in terms of uh, core capability around operations, technology and various uh, risk and finance functions. Um, so, uh, uh, over the time, you know, course of time, it's really pivoting more towards, you know, really uh, thinking outside in for the bank. What are the key priorities? You know, how do we help the bank open up the jaws? Mm. By that, what I mean is that, you know, how do we contribute towards more revenue generation mm. as well as driving costs down? Mm. And I think the, you know, if I would first pick the cost side of uh, equation, you know, we of course have the scale, we see everything coming in, we can join the dots here, we can drive scale through simplification. So I think the journey we've been on in the last couple of years is to uh, build deeper expertise and capability mm. and call out the key areas where we can simplify the uh, organization, the operating model, create almost platform-based industrialized services which uh, you know, drive uh, a significant efficiency. So that helps drive the, uh, you know, on the cost side uh, for us to uh, create an impact. And uh, you know, it's all, it needs a level of investment, needs a level of uh, uh, accountability and ownership, needs the right talent to drive that. On the innovation side, you know, on the, or the revenue side, it's all about figuring out, you know, what is it uh, that we can do to help uh, connect us better with the customers. Uh, so digital, um, you know, um, capabilities, um, stronger analytical um, capabilities around, uh, you know, uh, giving stronger customer insights, um, you know, are the kind of uh, areas that we are investing in in having stronger capability, stronger right. uh, way we can help our uh, businesses engage right. with the clients. Right, so when, when you look at what's happening from the emerging tech point of view, and I'm, I'm sure you're assimilating yeah. and absorbing a lot of this technology to obviously be competitive uh, to your customer once again. What, what does that entail? I mean, how, how is this absorption happening? How ready or how uh, geared is India? particularly or Indian skills geared for this? Yeah, no, I think uh, we are right at the heart of that. Uh, so if you uh, uh, look at uh, what's happening in the industry, you know, the over the course of uh, last several years, the personal, the technology that we consume in our personal lives has actually gone ahead of what an enterprise provides. Mm. You know, today we are used to having an always on technology. It's, um, you know, the apps will update seamlessly, et cetera, et cetera. You know, the, the experience is, uh, seriously frictionless and how we as an enterprise can help our customers get a similar experience. And I think the GCCs have a critical role to play, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, if I were to look at a bank, you know, like Barclays, uh, you know, we have tons of legacy infrastructure, we have a lot of confidential information, we are a highly regulated entity, you know, given all that, how do we still, uh, you know, uh, change the way we deliver technology uh, to be much faster and more bite-sized. Mm. So if we are uh, delivering functionality, you know, like six, uh, maybe five years back, we used to be, you know, monolithic, like an annual release or a six monthly release. Now it's moving towards every two weeks, you are releasing something into production, something that the, cost, uh, the end customer can actually touch and feel. Mm. So we as a um, global capability center for Barclays have deep expertise uh, from an engineering standpoint. We are investing in strengthening that uh, in upskilling talent so that we can help the organization pivot towards uh, driving some of the uh, you know uh, end customer outcomes faster right and and uh, give us an illustration of what that could be i mean uh, one illustration of what that what is it that you've done uh, maybe in the recent past or are working on that you can talk of that's resulting in that kind of uh, you know uh, change in maybe interface or change in experience for that customer yeah, like, you know, we have a strong uh, digital team, uh, you know, so uh, some of the uh, specific uh, uh, functionalities that, uh, you know, our mobile application, in fact, uh, for Barclays is uh, 
uh, rated uh, like a five star, you know, one of the best applications. In fact, it won uh, an award recently. Uh, so some of that functionality is being delivered by the team here. Mm. So we are organized into agile teams. A lot of the uh, both on the iOS and Android platform, the digital journeys um, are uh, being developed here. Um, so um, you know, um, there would be several examples where an end-to-end -end, uh, functionality is being delivered by a feature team sitting here. Mm -hmm. You know, and the model that we move towards is that. Uh, we have similar teams in the UK out here, and they're working off a common backlog, and you know they're delivering features into production to the customer. You mm. know whether it's mm. stay with points or whatever the latest and greatest new features that mm. we keep releasing on our app. Um, so some of that are developed end to end here. Right. So let me ask you a question a little bit about mm -hmm. the future. And I felt that a PhD in engineering is the best person to uh, ask that, answer that. So what is the future of automation looking like? I think uh, at least if I were to look at you know next three to five years, we are certainly entering the assisted automation space. Mm -hmm. You know, by that what I mean is that uh, you know clearly there's uh, machine learning and AI. There's obviously lots and lots of talk about it. Uh, I think uh, we are certainly starting to leverage that technology in a way where uh, it's starting to make decisions uh, not on their own, but at least uh, the initial uh, assisted decisions. You know, so a lot of the initial pre-work that historically was done by uh, you know, a bunch of people sitting around is now starting to get automated. Mm. We still need somebody to take the final call to review the, you know, mm. the decision that's coming through. And of course, the, most of these models need extensive training and uh, to, for them to be uh, of practical use. But I think we are certainly entering that, uh, that space where a number of use cases are starting to emerge where whether it's lending or credit or you know, uh, many areas where you're starting to see uh, you know, assisted uh, decision making. Um, there are, uh, of course, uh, areas like robotics, you know, I'm sure we hear a lot about it, uh, which I feel is relatively a simpler technology uh, from a pure mm -hmm. tech standpoint, and it has its space, uh, and it will certainly, uh, you know, yield, uh, you know, short-term business benefits by quick adoption, uh, but the real sort of excitement and uh, future of automation where it will really impact uh, people is in the space of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning where I think the models will keep getting more and more sophisticated mm. over time. Right. So last question, I mean, when sitting in India, how do you see the talent pipeline? What are the opportunities and the challenges or in some ways even the threats? Because finally, uh, a lot of this could be replicated elsewhere, delivered from elsewhere too. Absolutely. I think the, the entire uh, focus for us is on uh, having top talent, you know, uh, both in terms of upgrading our existing people and therefore continuous learning uh, is super important. I think uh, we really believe in uh, T-shaped uh, thinking in that sense that uh, every individual must have a strong eye to the T, you know, in the sense of a deep expertise uh, that is core to that uh, person and a good understanding of the breadth in terms of what the adjacencies are, how does uh, what you are delivering as an individual, how does it connect with the, the larger ecosystem. I think having said that, so therefore, you know, it's imperative for us to invest significantly in upskilling people. So whether it is, uh, you know, uh, the new ways of delivering in terms of uh, tool chains, agile, etc., you know, or a migration to cloud, uh, you know, we are really investing in bringing in that both the domain and technical expertise uh, into people. So creating the right um, learning environment, running lots of hackathons, which you know, in a way. Um, gamify or uh, create that accelerated learning opportunity for people, you know, are various ways to really upskill uh, people. But that, as you said, I mean, for GCCs, really uh, the pivot is now not towards number of people, but it's about the value and therefore it's about expertise and uh, skills. Right, Praveen, that's a good note to end on. Thank you so much for speaking with us. Thank you. Thank you.